OK, welcome, everybody. As you can tell, this is our first panel discussion of the day here on stage one. And uh, we're going to go right up until the first networking break. And we've got a fantastic uh, panel of speakers here to talk us through some of the hottest topics in sustainability and ESG strategies. Now, obviously, we cannot cover everything in 45 minutes. We're not going to attempt to. But hopefully, what we're going to do is provide some valuable insights and some of the experiences of the people that we have here assembled for you today. Now, I'm going to let these guys do most of the talking, but as the host, the moderator, I do need to make some introductions and keep the conversation moving along. There's still some people coming into the room. Please do grab a seat somewhere. Um, so, brief introduction from me, and then I'll let our speakers and panellists tell you more about themselves and why we should be listening to what they have to say today. <laughs> so, uh, to my immediate left, we have Adam Reed, who's the Chief Sustainability Officer at Suez. Um, then we have Smaruti Nake Jones, Chief Sustainability Officer at Deloitte. Uh, Nelson Muhumuza, Senior Vice President, Sustainability ESG and Public Affairs at City. And Nicholas Matzai, Vice President, Sustainability Europe at DP World. Please welcome your panel. Thank you. Now, as I said, there's a lot of ground to cover here and uh, fabulous speakers to share their views. So to kick things off, uh, Smaruti, I'm going to come to you. Um, how has sustainability evolved within your organisation in recent years, would you say? And what specific strategies have you implemented to embed it into the core business operations? Yeah, and, and for those of you who don't know, obviously Deloitte are one of the, the big four professional services firms. And my responsibility is really to help our organisation uh, manage their transformation as, as we advise uh, a number of clients as well. Um, and evolution is the right way to really talk about it. So we have been, um, uh, as a lot of organisations, really been focusing on sustainability, environmental or, or traditional CSR for a number of years, decades in fact. But over the last sort of three years, three, four years, we've really consolidated what we've been doing and, and using our network to, to great effect. So how do we bring it all together and how do we do that in a consistent and, and um, organised way? And actually, we're now looking to, to accelerate that. You know, we're, uh, we've heard from Schneider Electric and, and, and others. It, we're in that decisive decade. So this is the opportunity now for all of us to accelerate, and we're doing that ourselves. Interesting you say the, the decisive decade. It feels like the last decade should have been the decisive <laughs> decade as well. I'm sure we'll come back to that later. Uh, Nicholas, same question to you. So how is sustainability involved within DP World? And obviously tell us a bit about DP World for anyone who might not know. Yes, absolutely. I mean, first of all, thank you for having me here with such an esteemed panel and esteemed audience in here. I, I feel I'll be learning far more from everybody else than I can pass on necessary myself. So maybe get a couple of gold nuggets uh, from me. So DP World is a, a, a large global ports, logistics and freight forwarding business based in Dubai, uh, but I work in the European region of which are about 26,000 people currently, headquarters just 10 minutes down the road. And for us, sustainability um, is a relatively new function when we look at it from a strategic perspective. We have a, a fantastic chief sustainability officer, um, Maha, who's based in, in Dubai, and, and she has quite a uh, an impressive team, actually, recruited some of the most amazing people I've, I've met around the world. But it's a relatively new part. It's, it's only a couple of years old. And the regions from which I lead, the European region, again, I've only been with DP World now just over four months. Before, a lot of the activity was decarbonisation primarily, and that was focused with our colleagues in health, safety, security, and environment. It's very operationally orientated. But what we're trying to do now is think, how does sustainability impact every aspect of our business, so it's not just the carbon tunnel of, of decarbonisation. We're looking at net zero for here, so that's a part of it. But it's also what are the onward impacts? What sort of business do we want to be? Who do we want to be? What, are the, what is the engagement we're having with customers? And I really liked what you were saying then, because it, it, the, the conversation now is very much different between customers. We don't turn to them and say, hey, what services can we sell you? Now it's what problem can we solve for you? Because it's our problem as well. Uh, and the turning point, is it this decade, is it last decade? 
Um, my previous career was as an army officer, so when I was in Afghanistan, I remember every year, every year they would say, this is the decisive year, every year. And of course it was never a decisive year in the direction it should have gone. So in some ways, it's always the decisive year, and, and, and so now is the time to do that. But for our strategy, it's very much, you know, what problem are we solving for customers? Okay, yeah, good answer there. Um, Adam, coming to you next, bringing you into the fold here. Um, ESG has gained significant attention, quite rightly, in recent years. Um, as leaders in sustainability, um, how do you define ESG, and why is it important for businesses to incorporate ESG considerations into their strategies? And obviously tell us a bit more about Suez as well. Thanks, Chair. It's like the exam question I wish I didn't have <laughs> as an A-level sustainability student all those years ago. Uh, Suez... Recycling, a uh, resource management company, global operator. I look after sustainability, external affairs, communications in the UK, which is a really nice fit of, of an evolution, I think, of a business that used to put stuff in a hole in the ground. You know, then we decided that you know, our customers, rightly, are asking us to do things better. So recycling, recovery, now we're into reuse and repair, and we're already giving advice around waste prevention, which seems... A bit of an odd thing for a waste management company to do, but I'm not a waste management company. We're a resource management company, which means if our customers want to go on a journey of evolution towards less resources and better management of those resources, then it's our obligation to support them. It's interesting, though, you talk, you talk about ESG, and we don't, we don't use the language at all. We talk about the triple bottom line, and we've always talked about people, planet, and profit. So that seems to resonate with both our staff, which I think is really important when you talk about the journey you're on, because I think customers get sustainability, or at least they get some of it, because they know which bit they want to focus on. So in my case, it's usually recycle more and landfill less, and everything else will be a bonus, Adam. And, and I guess when we talk to our staff, they want to know about resource efficiency, or they want to talk about biodiversity on their site, because it's local to them. So we've started to take the, the triple bottom line approach, which is, as a company, making a profit is not a dirty word, because it enables us to do great social benefits and great environmental benefit. And, and therefore, you've got to get the balance. And I suppose my role, much like my esteemed colleagues, is to sit there at, at the board. So I'm, I'm one of seven UK board directors. And I've got the lens of how does this fit with decarbonisation? How does this fit with resource efficiency? How does this fit with social value? And so we make decisions on financial grounds, of course, but we try to balance as best we can that they're the right long-term agenda items and that way our customers see us as a long-term partner our staff see us as a long-term employer and ultimately we'll still be here in the 50-year transition that leads to net zero and beyond interesting you say there you're almost like phasing out the term esg is anyone else turning away from esg as a term i know for instance blackrock have stopped mentioning it i believe um uh, I was going to jump yeah. in because I'm sure we all have strong feelings. I'm sure everyone <laughs> in this room has strong feelings on the term ESG. I think ESG gets a bad rap. Mm -hmm. The reason I say that is it's, it's, it's a financial metric. And, you, know, you, you apply the metric, it has the results. There's nothing inherently wrong with having good ESG metrics. The problem is they're badly applied. That's, that's always been the issue. You know, if you game them you'll get for performance, then you're going to get the result that is, is gained from it. And if you're not doing it from a behavioral perspective, so, and it's interesting you mentioned triple bottom line because that's also one of the criticisms sometimes sustainability gets is where they say, well, where's it in the business case? Prove it in the business case. You know, and I always say to them, you've made the net zero commitment. I don't have to justify the business case anymore. <laughs> you signed the line, right? So this is where it com comes in. Of course, profit's not a dirty word. It, you need it to make the world go round. It's the fuel in the car, as, as Simon Sinek would say. But you have other commitments and the non-financial commitments are, are important. And if you measure them by ESG metrics, great, you know, and, and showcase them. But they're different to yeah. sustainability and CSR. Yeah. yeah, and I was going to mention something similar in terms of sentiment. You know, you can put words to it, they can get a bad rap. You can, you know, there will be 20 other words that will be used uh, for a similar thing. But it's really the action behind it and the sentiment and what's that driving. Yeah. Um, that I, I think is really important rather than the words that you put around it. And frankly, I'm, I'm a supporter of any levers that we could use in any way to make it happen. Um, so, um, but Nelson. Yeah. Yeah, so I just wanted to come in and say, you look at the news, you look at the, 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 the communication outside, outside there, 
and people are saying ESG is a bad thing, they're confusing ESG and sustainability, but what, what's sustainability, what's ESG? So if we moved away from the words, what, really, what we're get, really getting to is that we want to ensure that one, this generation, our current utilization of the resources we have, whether economic or whether natural, are passed on to the future generations. So that's really what we're really, all of us here, we're getting to. And ESG is one of the, the lenses through which you're looking at all the, those issues, environmental and social issues, and, and you're asking yourself from the governance, do we have the right stewardship of the resources that we have mm -hmm. to pass, pass them on to the next generation? So that's the bigger question we're trying to answer, and it's a system-wide approach to look at all those issues instead of looking at it and politicize it. We need to ensure that all those issues which are key to the next generations are looked at and we're actioning and we're looking at the purpose and the impact we intend to make and the legacy we leave behind. Yeah, you, you, you talked there about the purpose and the impact. Just tell us a little bit more, because we didn't really have an introduction from you, Nelson, as well. Tell yeah. us a little bit more about um, city and city groups' approach to sustainability and ESG as well. Yeah, so I work at City Group as a senior vice president for sustainability and ESG, and of course, climate risk. And my role really he here is, are we integrating climate-related risks into our normal risks, that's one. Two, really critiquing and challenging teams on the products we are de they are developing or selling or supporting our clients on the transition journey. Mm -hmm. How is that transition journey? How credible is the transition journey? So in terms of city, the strategies are around net zero commitments to 2050, but then of course in between the interim targets that we do have. The second strand we use is around the sustainable products. But then also, we also have diverse and inclusion targets, uh, which is the S of the, of the ESG. Yeah, so it's really those three strands, but touching more on climate, it's around, there's a recognition that we do have is that we have ambitious, ambitious targets, and also to being a financial institution, the majority of the finance emission, the emissions really are coming in from the clients that we do serve. So then how do we work with the, our clients on their transition journey? Because we can't wake up one day and you pull a plug off. You have to ensure that you're understanding their strategy, you're monitoring progress, and you're working together towards the transition. OK, thank you, Nelson. Um, I want to talk about some of the key sustainability challenges that organize, organizations currently face. Um, Smaruti, I'm going to come to you as well here. Um, how can they collaborate to, to overcome these hurdles? What can organizations do to tackle the biggest problems that we're facing? Yeah, and, it, and it's, we, there's a lot of talk about challenges in, and um, it almost makes it sound too hard <laughs> when you talk about that. So the one thing that I would say is that we're starting to take much more of an optimistic sort of tone to it. So, you know, think like, for example, renewables, um, we know are outpacing any projections. So how do we start to weave that into, into some of the narrative that we're talking about? Um, and then when we talk about collaboration, I don't think we can do this individually, you know, none of us on the panel, none of us in the room. So it's going to have to take that coordinated effort. Um, and that will be at a global level. So for example, you know, we like many other organizations are part of the UN Global Compact, uh, have uh, climate group um, uh, pledges as well. But we're also working with the Earshot Prize and using quite a lot of our, our pro bono time um, to spend with innovators to really help them and, uh, and the finalists around the Earthshot Prize to scale up, you know, how do they expand and, and move on. And then from a, from a, um, a, a local level, um, uh, you know, we, in, and Adam talked about it um, earlier, there are, you know, we know the built environment is a really hard to abate area. So we're sitting on the um, uh, UK Green Buildings Council as one of the 
first professional services, but I don't say it should be a first. I would almost encourage everyone <laughs> to be on that because we need to all come in and, and help out as well. And then from a regional perspective, there's an opportunity. I mean, it, within Deloitte, we've got brilliant minds, and I think that's the benefit of, <laughs> of working in an organisation that I do. And how do we use that with other organisations um, to, like, for example, we publish our circularity gap report, we do a number of thought pieces. How can we really come together and think together in order to solve some of those problems as well? So, so how are you doing that? Sorry, Nicholas. How are you doing that? How are you bringing those people together to, to pull that collective wisdom to get yeah. a better outcome? And we're doing that in a couple of different ways. So we're, we're doing that in, um, in terms of our focus areas. We've actually got four kind of systemic challenges that we're, we're looking at. So we're really looking to pull together, um, for example, one of them uh, that I've mentioned, circularity, but it is alliance partners of ours, clients that we work with, stakeholders, um, uh, um, um, any organize, you know, NGOs, um, anyone that is really interested in that, that topic, and coming together to be able to say, where, is, you know, where are the challenges? Where are the blockers? How could we collectively think that through? Um, and, and being able to do that. And more practically, from, because I'm focused on what we do as Deloitte, it's how do we work with um, you know, our suppliers, our, our landlords, uh, even more practically around you know, helping them shift to renewables, for example, really shifting their, um, uh, the, you know, some of the leaseholds and practically getting stuck in, I would say, as well. Yeah. Nicholas, yeah. sorry, Nelson. Yes. After Nelson, Nelson, go ahead. Yes, yeah, so I just wanted to talk on uh, collaboration. Yeah. When you look at the transition to net zero, uh, a report published by McKinsey says that we need around $300 trillion to finance the net zero transition. And only $6 trillion can be provided by financial institution on an annual basis, right? So what does that then mean? It means that there is need for collaboration between the public, the governments, the multilateral organizations and the financial institutions to finance the transition to net zero. So finance technology that we have today, is it at the right scale to move us to, to net zero? The answer is no. So there's need for finance as one of the challenges, but I think we are on a journey to walk towards there, but collaboration and partnership is key here. Okay. Yeah, I, the, the thing I wanted to add is, on the end, you know, when we think about collaboration, we've got at the business level, the country level, the, the NGOs and different organizations that we're, we're parts of. But, but there's also, I think, opportunities internally in businesses to think about collaboration between employees. And, and the energy and innovation and excitement they, that they have. Um, we're going through our European strategy development process. That's the business strategy, not the sustainability strategy. You'll be pleased to know the sustainability strategy is a part of the business strategy. They are not two separate things. Success. Um, and, and much of the business are actually building it for me. Easiest job going. Because they have so much energy and, and excitement for this. You know, all of them have got families. They're all talking to me and saying, you know, my kids are at school and they're saying that they're talking about dying nature and there's not enough bees around and things are getting hotter and they're worried about drought. And, and so they're coming and saying, what can we do? And I said, what do you want, what do you want to do? You know, and they said, well, we want, to, we want to make sure all of our warehouses, all of our ports use renewable energy. And I said, build a plan, build a plan. Let's fight for it. Let's go find the case. I know, you know, our, our CEO Rashid in, in Europe and our and our uh, global chairman, these are all absolutely ambitious targets and commitments, but we need our people to drive towards it, to find the bits that they can do. And, and they work, they've been working together and building this through. We're building propositions off the back of it. We're trying to make sure that we have things like electric vehicles everywhere, maybe hydrogen trucks. Are we ahead of the market? Is the market behind? These are all great questions that we are now deploying 26,000 people to solve, not just one or two or three people. Um, and, and, and that's that's generating amazing things and, and, and outcomes. And, and at the same time, it's profitable. You know, they're seeing the, the, the bottom and top line being driven through from it. And our customers are really excited as well because they're going, well, these are our goals too. So the collaboration internally is just as powerful as, as externally, I'm finding. I, I couldn't agree more. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I think you know, I've got 300 and 
30 sustainability champions across our sites who are doing bottom-up great innovation, sharing amongst themselves about how their site is getting that little bit better, whether it's you know, going with LED lights or the electrification of the fleet or planting you know, wildflowers. The, the, the opportunities are maybe small, but when you replicate them and you share them, you empower people, then they can see that they can influence the board. And that, I think, is the really important thing, is that they have a voice through people like us mm -hmm. to make stuff happen. But it's already happening. And my job's just to help them to make it happen more. Um, but I think also the collaboration externally is really important. You, you know, we talk about NGOs, we talk about the, you know, the think groups, right? I mean, there's some brilliant cross-sectoral activities happening right now. I mean, I talk about the, you know, the Circular Economy Task Force, or I talk about the Aldersgate Group. These are groups that we put our time our professional time and effort into because we believe that they're bigger than any one business. These issues need cross-sectoral collaboration. Green skills is one of my big, big pet, 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 you know, pet passions at the moment. If we're really going to decarbonise in the next 30 years, less hopefully, then we need you know, thousands if not millions of people coming into our sectors who are ready, skilled to deliver transition in a way that, you know, maybe my son is not being schooled in exactly that way right now. And therefore, we have to be bigger than our companies, which is why we're here today sharing and you're here today sharing, because actually we have to collaborate to make this happen. So congratulations, all of you. <laughs> I think this is, we, we've revealed the biggest scam that being a CSO <laughs> or a VP of sustainability <laughs> it's all about other people's work, so, which is true, which yeah. is true. I mean, just, uh, I mean, that people power piece, I think, is, is really important. And, and actually, Adam, I'll, uh, we'll talk later about green skills because that's something that, that we're absolutely focused on and, and working with IEMA. Um, uh, around green, green skills for a green economy, so there's the, there's yep. there's lots of potential for us to to do more there. But in terms of um, uh, sort of sustainability, particularly for an organisation like Deloitte, where we are pe are our people, uh, we're a very people heavy business, and but our people really enjoy the work that they do around sustainability. So some of the Earthshot partnership um, Earthshot finalists, they say that's my, some of the most fulfilling work that they're doing because they're really seeing um, and being able to help those small scale innovators scale up in a way that probably wouldn't have happened if we hadn't uh, you know, provided some of that support. Um, but there is that power of how, uh, how much they want us to do this. So our Gen Z and millennial survey tells us each time that they want businesses to do more. Um, and actually it really did mention, and they are saying, please help us reskill and be skilled for this low carbon economy. We know it's coming, we can see it, we're anxious about it, and we want a role in it. What is that role? Please help us. So I think as organisations, it's for us to also provide that platform. And I liked what you said, Adam, which is it's we're there to give them the platform in our roles, um, you know, rather than sort of dictate in terms of what they, what they need to do, because they're telling us already. Just sticking with that on the reskilling and um, talent side, um, whose responsibility is it to provide that training and um, you know create those people to fill those jobs of the future? Because you're saying, for instance, you know you can do more, you can do more. What like or you also said, I think that maybe the schools are not teaching yeah. I, so the I right sit, skills. I, I sit on the green jobs delivery group, which is cross sectoral for government departments, DfE, uh, Desnes. DEFRA and Department of Works and Pensions. So you've got the right people in the room at ministerial level and, and sectoral representation, including IEMA in there, <laughs> yeah. um, which is great. And, and I think the, recognize, the recognition is that we, the policy framework needs to be clear. We need schools to be encouraged to teach things that are going to be relevant <laughs> to society as it adapts, which at the moment, getting stuff on the curricula can be quite difficult. Making stuff accessible to teachers is hard because they're very, very busy. So we've got to create it in a way that is seamlessly deliverable. It, it's our responsibility as industries. We, we've got to train our staff to, so that they're ready and, 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 and appropriate for, for the challenges we face. And we also need a load of additional college engagement and university engagement so that they're not putting on courses that are either 10 years out of date or just inappropriate because they've not been watching the way the sectors are shaping. And there are lots of courses at all levels that just aren't right for the world that we're going to be in five to ten years from now. 
So we're trying to bring that together. There will be a report issued probably at Easter, depending on elections. Um, and I'm hoping that will set a clear vision for what government commitment is around upskilling, reskilling, and a t you know, a talent acquisition. But there will also be charters in there for industry in terms of what we're willing to commit to um, and what our part in that process is. So I think progress is being made, but it is taking a long time. Yes, yeah, so if I pick on that, so remember when I talked about sustainability being a systems approach, and in the lens of social sustainability, there's that piece of ideas, the knowledge and the human capital we are tra transferring into the future, right? Mm -hmm. So it's everybody's responsibility to ensure that the knowledge we are impacting onto the future generation is preserved today and we, we, are, pre we are passing on the right knowledge. So from governments, the education institutions, to corporations, to where this new, the new generation is working at. So which kind of skill sets are we impacting onto the future generations in terms of scaling, in terms of on-the-job training? So it's really everybody's responsibility. And when you think about it in a systems way, you realize it's a whole ecosystem mm -hmm. to ensure that there's knowledge transfer to the future generation from the current generation and it's a recognition as well that the business models of today are really going through fundamental transformation and it's this future generation that is going to pick up these skills and move on to the next. It's a really good point and we're talking now about like uh, the next generation who are, who are gonna come in and um, solve all these issues that we've created. <laughs> what about, what about the, the current employees or the current generation, how are they how are they adapting? Are, are they embracing the opportunity to reskill? would you say? Is it something that they're passionate about and they're, they're, they want to get involved in that as well rather than just passing it down the line to another generation? Yeah, so maybe if I just speak on and maybe I will let others speak. So when we started working in the sustainability space, right, you'd get a question of what is sustainability? How big is your team, right? Yeah, so it's, it's amazing to see how tremendously, like over the last three years, you've seen ESG and sustainability permeate through mm. the fabric of the business units and people, ev every product or services, everyone is talking about sustainability. So it's getting there. So you're seeing people embrace it and being part of the business unit, being coined into the core business activities. So we are getting there. People are embracing it. Yes, there's a bit of, uh, I don't know, it's a short-term thing, it's a very long-term thing, but we will get there. Well, we, it's, it's fascinating actually engaging with our, um, our warehouse workers and our portside workers actually on the topic of sustainability, because for them, it's a bit immaterial, in all honesty, and, and that's not their fault. It's the way we talk to them about it. So we make the mistake and we go and tell them, climate change is happening and the world's going to increase by 1.5 degrees C and then maybe 2.5 degrees C and they go, look, I'm just, I got I to gotta feed my kids. Cost of living crisis is, is, is my big, big problem. And it's not that they don't care because they live in these communities. When I go down to London Gateway, one of our, our biggest port in Europe, and I speak to people there, they tell me how enthusiastic they are about their local community. Their local town is a lovely place. It's not the richest town in the world. And so they, when, they, when they go back home, they're seeing the challenges that their local town is, is facing. They see the diesel trucks as they go by. They know the pollution from, from the ships. They don't want that there. But at the same time, when we talk to them about climate change, look, it's too big, global problem. That it, it, it's not, not a material to them. So what we try to do is, first of all, talk to them about things that are tangible to them. We talk about pollution, they get it. We talk about local wildlife, they totally understand. If they think about waste and they think about water pollution, these are not things that they want, and they can actively see it around them so they can get involved. And from there, we can then take them on the training and skills to help resolve that. So then circularity becomes a really important part because they understand how waste and recycling impacts them locally. How we think about the, the emissions down from the ships and we think about trying to switch away from diesel to alternative energy, you know, they can feel the air quality improving. It doesn't really matter that 
yeah, that impacts climate change, it improves the situation, but they have a tangible measurement against it and they can apply those skills to actually improve not only their knowledge of the business, but also when, when we're putting up solar panels in these areas, this is a technical skill, they need to know how they operate. So they enjoy being upskilled on it and they, they see the benefit. And that I think is always the big gap and we, we know there's a lot of people that don't believe in climate change and there's no point shouting at them on the side and say, oh, the IPCC says, they're like, well, they ain't gonna read the report. So it, it, you've got to talk to them in ways that's, that's meaningful. Um, and, and, and with local workers, it's very much what is happening in your community by where you live. I mean, I totally concur. I mean, I've got 6,500 staff in sewers in the UK. You know, 5,500 are frontline, very busy, worried about cost of, mm -hmm. cost of living, and worried about their local environment. So if they drive more efficiently, reduces their fuel usage, great. If they've got an electric vehicle, they see the benefit, but it's all about the local language. I'm not gonna roll in there and try and teach them sustainability principles 101. A, they'd never give me the time. You know, it's how long does it, you know, does it take to eat a bacon butty mm -hmm. and a cup of tea before, before they start work? So it's the bite size, how does this work locally? How do I empower them to do what they want to do for their, their local site or depot or team? And then we then capture the data and then show back to them later on in the year the benefits. And that's, I think, the key point for a team like us is we can take what they're doing and then replicate it or showcase it or exemplify it. We don't need them to be doing it because it's climate change or because it's decarb or even sustainability. It's just the right thing to do. And if they're doing it, happy days. Yeah, and Nelson mentioned something about core business and getting it into the core business. So one of the things that we've done is uh, last year was introduced a sustainability clause and that wasn't necessarily to have words on a bit of paper it was really about empowering our teams to have a dialogue with each other to say how are we going to deliver this is this the most sustainable way that we could do this and with the client in order to talk about it so really talk about our how and challenge some of those ways of working that might have been you know, historically okay to have been done, particularly pre-pandemic, but post-pandemic, you know, that has shifted, particularly perceptions and, um, uh, you know, around whether that's hybrid working or the digital approaches has really moved on. So we've been able to empower our, our people through our core business activity to say, here you go, here, you know, here is something that will really help you have those conversations. We're not gonna make this hard. Um, and how do we take out some of those blockers for you um, and help you um, uh, to do that? So I think, as you said, you've got the people who will come regardless of whatever you do. Uh, then you've got the people that um, uh, uh, Nicholas that talked about that just are worried about everything else. Um, but actually, it's the how do you make it easy? How do you use some of the... We, I mean, for example, we use some of the behavioural change um, uh, um, uh, nuances to, to adapt our approach. So it was, you know, how do we make it default so that somebody doesn't have to have a difficult conversation? How do you put a nudge in so that actually it is just there and, and therefore they don't have to actively think about it, but they're just doing it anyway? Um, but also, how we've been able to use some social norms as well. So, you know, if we're all doing it, then, you know, that means, you know, that you're more likely to have another crowd of people doing it much more as well. So I think it's just using everything you have uh, in your arsenal to be able to do it and actually looking ahead, like we're constantly looking for new ideas. So if, if anyone has anyone, <laughs> any, <laughs> then please send them to me because I, I will happily take them. But, uh, you know, it's being open to that um, rather than just how we've always done it. OK, um, we've got about 10 minutes left and there's a couple of topics that I, I want to make sure that we cover. Um, so for the first time at this, uh, this show, I'm going to mention AI. So anyone playing um, show bingo, that's the first time I've mentioned that. Um, and you talked there about innovation and new ideas. So what role can technology and digital innovation, including AI but not limited to AI, what role can that play in promoting sustainability and advancing ESG strategies? And I'm just going to leave that open to whoever wants to tackle it. Yes, so the importance of uh, technology and digital towards sustainability uh, goals. If you look at renewable energy, look at electric vehicles, look at carbon capture, 
all that behind all those initiatives is technology. If you look at shipment industry, right, and you wanted, for example, to improve data capturing of the emissions across the value chain, tech digitalization of attaching digital codes onto the shipments mm -hmm. from the cradle up to where the, the destination, technology lies at the heart of all those initiatives. So I really see technology being at the center of even uh, at the center of this transformation. So technology, financial investment into that technology to scale it up to a level required is really key to ensure that we move and achieve our net zero commitments. I see you nodding away there, Adam. Yeah, I, I mean, I totally agree. I mean, you know, electrification of the fleet, mm -hmm. yes, carbon capture technologies, yes. That, I mean, the investment is already being made significantly to to change the landscape, if you like. Um, but I think it's all about behaviours, because I think for all the technology in the world, if we don't get people to use it right, we end up with very inefficient systems. Mm -hmm. yeah. So I think a lot of the effort that's going in at the moment is around apps and the ability to capture data or to capture ideas or innovation so that people can be part of a community. Because let's be honest, we all live on our phones, don't we? I brought them up here <laughs> just for effect. But um, it's... Um, and, and actually, my frontline staff are just as au fait with a smartphone as, as the brightest people in the business. So in some ways, it's, it's making stuff accessible. And, and just to add, I spent two days last week in Paris, which wasn't out of choice, um, but I do work for a French company. And, um, but I spent it with Microsoft, and we were talking AI for two days, and then we went to our research labs on the outskirts of Paris to talk about some of the work that, that Suez are doing globally at the moment. And it fascinates me, not only how we can automate and generate greater efficiencies, but how we can predict the future, and therefore what are the technologies that we might want to invest in. I mean, we are on the cusp of, you know, un in terms of, you know, that kind of rapid rise of innovation, the world is about to explode. Yes, that's a risk for some people, and yes, some of you might not like it, but I've got to be honest, that having spent more time recently thinking about this, I think it's exciting. And I think we, if we can harness it, you know, the opportunities are endless in terms of what it can do for us and what it can do for our customers and the supply chain, because that's my big question. Can we take them with us on the journey? Can we make it easier for them to, to green their supply chains or to green their decisions? Because then we can become the, the partner mm -hmm. of choice as we all transition. And I think having good data, first speaker talked about good data, you know, having a, a transparency in terms of the data flows and the information, that's where I think AI can really play a role. And, and to me, that's quite exciting. Yeah, and just picking up on, um, uh, on what Adam was saying around the, the, the two areas, I think that engagement and, and people engagement is, is going to be key. And that is where I think digital uh, can make that difference. And, and we've been partnering with a social enterprise called Geeky Zero in order to do that with our own staff. But, uh, you know, and, and it really has helped. They've been able to challenges and all sorts of things. But I wouldn't underestimate those types of solutions. I think sometimes when you think about tech and digital, everyone goes for big, sort of shiny, <laughs> very big um, pieces like AI, uh, which, as Adam said, are going to be, uh, you know, game changing in, in effect. Um, but data, you've also uh, picked up, it is. It's, it's um, one of those areas where um, I think we talked about it uh, you know, uh, quite a while ago about ESG and, and all the requirements and, and the data that's going to be um, expected. Um, and, uh, and it wouldn't surprise you, but Deloitte, we have uh, our, uh, a green light solution. But that is really to bring in all of those um, data sets and start to really... Um, manage those because we have such a broad uh, customer and client base and an alliance network that we're able to do that. But I, I think that those are the areas where you'll, you know, we'll, we can really shift it within our organisations. But I think as the, in terms of the world, I think absolutely, um, as, as Nelson said, uh, there is a huge amount of opportunity there. Can I be controversial? Yes, please. Yes. <laughs> Good. I don't disagree with anything my, my fellow panellists have said in terms of the potential, but I think AI is trash currently. I, I think it w will deliver nothing for the next few years, other than 
getting rid of coders from their own jobs, because <laughs> ChatGPT4 can do that. The basis for a lot of the AI engines we have at the moment are essentially dumb search models that are able to scrape through illegally taken copyrighted data. So OpenAI under huge, huge uh, legal challenges at the moment, just like the Napster of 25 years ago for Lime, LimeWire. If anyone's ever heard, I never knew what that was until recently. <laughs> um, these models are almost certainly not going to be usable soon because the copyright legal issues they're going through are going to collapse them. So the direction of AI and the use of the technology is not going to continue in the route that we're, that we're going. So I, I have great doubts of the ability of AI to solve the current problems. I, I saw Kate Brandt, Chief Safety Officer at Google in, um, in COP28 talking about this. And on the panel, she was asked, what about the emissions from the data centers that have been created from all these terrible, you know, people on chat GPT all the time asking silly questions they could get from a book or from Google, uh, or things like Bitcoin and NFT and the engines going around, the driving emissions from those things. And they kept saying, oh, no, no, but AI can solve the emissions. And, and the answer is no, AI can't solve the emissions that have been created by AI itself. It's, it doesn't work that way. You know, the, the amount of emissions are going up, the energy use is going up from these things. They are not addressing, not reducing the energy use. So technology has a fantastic you know, capability, but so far there is nothing I have seen that, that digitization and AI will solve the problem for us. It's people that will solve the problem, the actions that humans take. Good data will really help guide us, but we have to analyze it and then take the decisions off the back of it. And that's almost certainly going to be for the next five years because the data sets and the systems are based on computer systems that come from 50, 40, 30 years old. I was doing it at BT. BT, the reason why you can't get your network plugged in quickly with OpenReach is because the records are so out of date, they're like 30 or 40 years old. That was a problem I was addressing 10 years ago. These things haven't really moved on. It's all based on spreadsheets and old databases. So I am a bit cynical about it, but I believe in the potential. <laughs> uh, quick show of hands, does anybody agree with Nicholas? Oof. And I wasn't expecting zero uh, people to say that. I'm glad um, one. Uh, <laughs> uh, for, for, for the benefit of people who are not in the room, I'd say that's 5 to 10%, five percent, six, maybe. Five, yeah. That's fair. Um, He's got his acolytes. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> the radicals in the room, I think. So many people from DP World in the room. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, so I just wanted to, uh, I will not say something controversial. Just wanted to mention about uh, greenwashing. And uh, to the point he made, if we are talking about the data centers, we need to ensure that to avoid the risk of greenwashing, the electricity powering the, the data centers is really coming from renewable centers. Mm -hmm. So I think if we look at it, yes, there are potential for technology, but also we need to ensure that the powering behind those data centers, the power behind electric vehicles, is looked at to ensure that it's coming from the renewable energy centers. Absolutely. I mean, I know we, we've got a session later on talking about the aviation industry, for instance, mm. and data centers produce more emissions than the aviation industry. Uh, but everyone, you know, is up in arms about aviation and how terrible it is and people shouldn't be flying everywhere. But yeah. tell people they can't be bringing two phones to our show and um, Googling things and yeah. um, there'd, be, there'd be revolution, wouldn't there, Adam? Well, there's a revolution when you tell them they can't fly anywhere, to be honest. <laughs> well, yeah. You know, it's, just, it's a difficult sales pitch. <laughs> but on the point, which is, you know, uh, in these discussions, it's very easy to then go to, oh, well, that, right, you know, that's not going to solve the problem, and this is too hard and too difficult. So I think we need to come back to, sorry, Nicholas, to the optimistic side, which is actually, <laughs> you know... Uh, uh, things are moving on. You know, we, we're hearing about um, actually uh, businesses, corporates, individuals using um, renewable energies over uh, some of the fossil fuel alternatives because it's so much cheaper. So I think absolutely there are challenges and there are always going to be challenges and there always has been. But how do we make sure that we do not use that to limit the action that we still need to take? And how do we use technology and digital to enable us all being aware that we need to help those hard to abate areas to help those industries and those sectors to transform? Okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah, I think that's a more positive way, definitely, to end it. Um, we are actually out of time, sadly. Um, but just one very quick comment from all of you. Um, so just one takeaway from this, for instance. So if you can just give me your, your closing thoughts. And I'll start off with Adam. 
Uh, it's all about the people. <laughs> okay, thank you. Some rooty. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, apart from Adam stealing my life, <laughs> um, I, I would say actually it's about collaboration, and we've just we've talked about that, and, and whether that's internally. Um, or whether that's externally, I think that there is a role for all of us to come together on this. Brilliant. Nelson? Uh, I think to me it's about the purpose and the impact we intend to make. Perfect. Mm -hmm. and well, I've got to repeat, it's about the people. I absolutely agree with that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, it's all about the people, people. That's what we wanted to hear, isn't it? Okay, uh, brilliant session. Thank you.